ladies and gentlemen, Production Music Libraries, what they are and what they can do for you with Dean Kerpain. Woohoo! <laughs> Hello, Dino. How are you, buddy? I am doing good. Thanks for, thanks for having me here. Oh, thanks for doing this. You know, uh, I appreciate the fact that people will take the time out of their busy lives to help educate <laughs> all of our members. Um, so yeah, I figured who better to talk to about production music libraries than you? I want to give the folks a little brief bio here. Uh, Dean is a veteran songwriter, musician, author, artist, music producer, and highly successful taxi member. His music has been heard on hundreds of TV shows. It may be thousands by now. I think I'm using a bio from like three years ago. Hundreds of TV shows, films, and new media around the world. He's also earned gold and platinum records when his song, Do Your Thing, appeared on Stephanie Heinzman's album, Master Plan, on Universal. Dean is also the author of the Amazon best-selling books. Uh, hold them up in the right order here. <laughs> Demystifying the cue. This is a must-have book. If you are watching this and you have not read this book, I'm not plugging it because Dean's sitting here with me. I'm plugging it because thousands of taxi members have read this book and literally call it life-changing. And, of course, you have to buy the companion book, which is also amazing. You literally have to have these two books. It's not a matter of should I. It's a matter of if you don't, you're only hurting yourself. I, I cannot enforce that enough. Uh, he also wrote Write, Submit, Forget, and Repeat, which was inspired by the often heard taxi member mantra, Write, Submit, Forget, and Repeat. If there's anybody who can explain what production music libraries do and why they can be valuable partners for indie songwriters and composers, Dean Crepain is that guy. So, um, Dean, for the unfamiliar folks, there may be people tuning in here today that really don't know. They hear the phrase libraries, they hear music libraries, the whole phrase is production music libraries. I don't want people to think it's someplace you go with a card and check something out. Tell them what a production music library actually is. Uh, production music libraries are, well, it's a business, it's a, it's a company or a business, and what they do is they seek to sign um, songs or cues from artists, composers, songwriters, and uh, build up a catalog of different styles, different genres, uh, for the purpose of um, giving their clients the right song, the right cue, the right thing. And the clients being films, TVs, advertisers. Uh, so they're, they, yeah, that's basically what they do. They're a uh, kind of in between, uh, find great music and great cues and great songs, or better put, find the right music and the right songs, uh, put them into their libraries, and they act kind of like a publisher, kind of like a, well, they are a publisher and, a, and um, probably different than a record company, but they're the in between. They get the clients, uh, the films, the TV stuff, and they get the music and they put two and two together, and hopefully everybody makes money. So let's tell folks what the difference is between a production music library, which, like you said, is a publisher, and then a regular publisher like Sony ATV or Universal or Warner Chapel that, that would be the, on the uh, record side of the industry. Yeah, the old school publishers, um, old school, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's still going on, but um, they, you know, they're looking for songs for artists. They're, you know, whether whether it's uh, you know Justin Bieber or or uh, Garth Brooks or whoever the the people are, they're looking for songs for those artists. They're actual songs for signed artists. Um, oh getting a weird thing on your audio you're not like tapping your hand on the table are you uh, uh, sorry sorry i was getting animated yes i was oh, okay all right I, I will i'll stop playing drums <laughs> I, was, I was trying to make a cue while we we're doing this but yeah back back to that they uh, um um yeah hold still here they were uh <laughs> They got, got songs for artists, for main, uh, you know, good good artists, whereas the artists, to think of it like an old school publisher is a music, uh, a production music library. The artists are a TV show. The artist is a film. The artist is a advertising. So they're getting the music for those people. Only it's, we are actually doing the masters and fully producing it. Where in the old days of of songwriting, you you could do you know a, a, a vocal song demo. You get it to somebody, somebody, and and then they're they're amazing producers and and musicians cut the thing. 
but actually now, uh, especially in this day and age of home studios, we're we're doing all that stuff. So I don't know if that yeah. explains it. No, it, it it does. Um, and, and the deals are a little different in that, like a traditional publisher on the record side of the industry, um, they would sign people to a uh, staff writer deal where they might give you an annual stipend of 25000 or 50000 yeah. or maybe back in the day, or if you're somebody who's kind of important and, and already successful, 100000 or more. And they basically work the push model, which is they hear that Ariana Grande is working on a record. They look through their catalog, see what they've got, that they then go knock on on her producer's door, figuratively speaking, and say, hey, check out these songs. We think these might be good for her or whomever the artist is. Um, the production music library model is more of a pull model where... Um, they come to you and say, this is what we need in the form of a brief or a taxi listing. This is what we're looking for. Do you have anything like that? So it's filling orders on the production music library side versus pushing your wares on the traditional record industry side of publishing. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Uh, so people often ask me, I, I, you know, I, I can't believe that they want 100% of my publisher's share. Or is this, you know, it's basically a 50-50 deal. Is that fair? Um, can you kind of give an overview of what typical production music library contracts or deals look like? Yeah, it is It is a 50-50 deal. And, and yeah, I've, I've heard that before, too. You don't want to give away your publishing. Your, well, you know, um, yes, I do. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I uh, well, and the and the thing is, um, what people that say that I go, you know, if you want to start your own production music library, if you want to be a publisher, then you'll spend all your time getting connections with music supervisors and and ad companies and all that, and you'll do the legwork and you'll do all that stuff. Well, that's I don't live in L.A. or New York. I live in Seattle, and so I don't have really have good access to that. Although I. I had considered doing that uh, about ten years ago, <laughs> but you you. Um, you really uh, they're doing all that work they have the connection so i'm you know i'm giving up really i'm 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 they're getting 50 percent of the monies that are collected and then that is that's typical 50 50 deal we keep all the writers royalties and uh they get the publishing because they're doing all the publishing work and we just get to sit here and create and don't have to do all that other business stuff on that side um and do all the leg, leg work and develop and, and maintain all those great connections. Uh, so, yeah. so oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, that, that's it. Um, so yeah, and even beyond building the great connections and maintaining those relationships, it's first of all, reviewing all the music, then doing all the due diligence to make sure that the music you want to sign isn't already published. A common mistake these days is putting your music out with like TuneCore, CD Baby or somebody checking that box that says, yeah, make it available for sync. And you don't realize that by checking that box, you've just signed a, a, a publishing deal yeah. um, or, or at the very least a publishing admin deal. And that makes you unavailable or un, unable to sign a deal with a regular music library because you can't have two publishers on the same thing unless it's um, non-exclusive and that's a whole other thing we'll yeah. talk about. Yeah. But um, no, that's, that's really true. And I just, I am so willing to give up a percentage of this uh, for, you know, I'm, I'm not making deals with Netflix and Amazon and ABC, NBC, CVS, all the cable companies, everybody else, they're out there doing that work. So, yeah. uh, you know, they, they uh, deserve that money. Just the tagging alone, when I talk to my friends that own production music libraries, the amount of work they do to get the stuff into their system. Yeah. Um, first of all, some, some libraries actually choose to master everything they put in the library. Yeah. Um, uh, they all have to tag the stuff. They have to present it to their clients in formats that they are amenable to, that they will use. Um, certain ways of delivering it. it. It's a lot of work on the back end. Oh, and absolutely. Then, there's there's a couple uh, libraries that I work with that they 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 are they're mastering everything. I have to send them stems. I stem out everything, and they're, wow. they're they they master because they want their library to be consistent. All the all the very you know fifty a hundred composers uh, putting stuff in it. They want it to be uh, mastered consistently. So yeah. uh, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, so we, we kind of covered, uh, 
people say, I'm not giving 100% of my publishing. And I think a lot of people um, develop that mindset because they took a, a course in college or they've got a friend who's normally a real estate lawyer in Chillicothe, Ohio, who took a music uh, law course in college or in law school. And they go, oh, no, dude, you never give up 100% of your publishing. Well, you're not actually giving up 100% of your publishing. You're giving up 100% of the publisher's share, and they work to get that money. So everybody yeah. that's got that thought that some real estate lawyer or you know somebody who does wills and trusts or any other kind of law other than doing music law or entertainment law every day, forget what they say. <laughs> it's, yeah, in, yeah. in this case, it's not true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it'd be there are things where I have held on to my publishing because I have the connection with uh, I think there was a T-Mobile thing I did, and there was a couple other things where I'm sorry, I'm pounding, I'm doing playing <laughs> drums again. I, uh, uh, somebody needs to duct tape my hands. The uh, um, the, 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 where where I've actually uh, have kept my publishing, but that's because I already had the connections. Um, but as a general rule, production music libraries, no, I, I give it up. You know, um, almost probably almost 100 percent of the time, you yeah. know, to get what I need want to get. Um, so, again, for the uninitiated, uh, I know that most of our members know this pretty well, but we might have people watching that aren't members um, or don't know the difference between what an exclusive production music library deal is versus ah. a non-exclusive. And, mm. and that's a pretty hot topic. It seems to have calmed down a little bit over the last couple of years. But can you please explain the difference? Yeah, exclusive uh, is just what it says. You, they, you sign your your masters, your your songs, your cues, and um, they have all the rights to them. They exclusive. They own. They own this stuff. Uh, uh, Non-exclusive. Um, they have the rights to per, to uh, pitch the stuff that you s send them, but you can also take that uh, music elsewhere. And, uh, and and do other things with it. You still maintain the rights to do uh, release CDs or to pitch it other places if you want to. Although that can get really dicey uh, if you're signing non-exclusive with multiple libraries. There is that uh, potential problem that both libraries pitch to the same show. They take it. Well, who gets paid? Library A or Library B that had it non-exclusively? So that's a you know that's a tricky one there. But exclusive, um, yeah, they. They own, although there's there's some exclusive deals that I've done. I grabbed a few of my recent contracts here and was looking them over where um, I've actually got the rights with the exclusive deal to if I want to release a CD of this stuff, I can't. Um, but that's about all the other stuff I can do with it. But, you know, if you're if you're an artist or a songwriter and you want to um, uh, uh, produce a, a CD of your music, but you also want to work for film and TV, there are exclusive companies that will allow you to do that. And they'll put that right in the contract. I, uh, um, I like both. I probably do a lot more exclusive contracts these days for various reasons, um, but I've, I'm in both non-exclusive and exclusive libraries. Um, how many libraries in total give or take do you have your music in at this point how long have you been doing sync stuff like 10 years or more now yeah it's more than that i think i well my first road rally was in 2006 wow. and i had through taxi i gotten lucky a couple of years before that and i had gotten into uh music into a show called one life to live a soap opera that was on at that time and so I was starting to get my first taste. So it was probably 2005, 2006. So yeah, 15, 16 years. It was probably 2000 after that first road rally, which everybody that goes to their first road rally, like here this weekend, um, or the one in, in the physical one in person, um, your eyes are open. If you're a person that isn't, you know, and, and it's just like, it's going from black and white to technicolor and uh, and you learn so much and I went wow this is actually uh, uh, this is actually something in the music business that you can build a career on and and, and you can't say that about some things in the music business you know you got to roll the dice am I going to be an artist and a superstar well I, you can't build that career per se uh, but the film and TV I, I saw that oh you can do these steps and build a, a real business out of this thing and have a real career out of it. So yeah, 15, 16, 17 years, somewhere around there now. And and I think I'm in, I knew you were going to ask me how many libraries. So I was trying to go through them and I, 
what it, it might be more than this, but I found contracts for 39 libraries. So now I'm wow. in 39 <laughs> libraries now, but, but, uh, um, it may be, there may be some more. Um, that's a lot of libraries. Congrats. Um, do you know how many pieces of music you have out there in the wild it, in all those libraries, give or take? It's about somewhere around 1,400 uh, pieces of music that I have, you know, some, somewhere around 1,400. I, I, I'm not going to broadcast your income and I don't know what it is, I, but I, I do. <laughs> but I, I know enough taxi members who are succeeding at the level that you're at that uh, once they get up over a thousand, uh, you know, and it takes a couple of years, obviously, for the money yeah. start to, to flow. And it takes several years, many years to get up to a thousand tracks out there in the wild. Once yeah. they get over a thousand tracks and then, you know, up to around 1500, it's like you have a real business and you are yeah. going to retire with a retirement fund built on what I affectionately call stupid little instrumental cues. You know, doom, do, doom, do, doom, 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 yeah. Kim yeah. Kardashian is trying to get the cap off the milk container. And it's laughable. Sometimes they pay pennies, but it's cumulative and it builds up each year and it keeps growing and growing. And man, if you're at 1400, congratulations, yeah. dude. Yeah, my, my brother wanted me to tell you this uh, um, because <laughs> I told him the other day. It, it, when I first started doing this 15 years ago, I. I open a, a Charles Schwab account just to, I go, oh, I'm going to see how much, you know, just take the money I didn't need to live on. I wasn't buying gear with, I wasn't doing just from royalties and, um, uh, you know, just extra thousand here, extra 1500 there and invest it. And that account now, and, and this is not, this is not a lot, but I'm going to make a point with this. That account now has over $200,000 in it. And for doing nothing, it makes me 8%. It makes me $16,000 a year for doing nothing. Just in that, that's not my main retirement account, but this, I just wanted to see over the years what would happen if I just took my extra money and invested it conservatively uh, in, in stocks. And so, you know, yeah, it, you know, and if I was dumping all of it in, it'd be a lot more, but, you know, I buy things. And, uh, <laughs> I have a couple remember. Houses. Uh, years ago, uh, probably five years ago or more now, um, we had a, uh, one of our members who's a certified financial planner do a thing on stage with me, um, laying out basically an Excel spreadsheet that showed, uh, and, and using very conservative numbers on what you would earn and how it would grow each year. And if you yeah. started at 35 years old, did it till 65 and let's assume that you retire at 65 which there's no reason to if you're a musician you're going to keep yeah. making music anyway but if you did retire i think you would retire with like 1.7 million dollars in the bank yeah. taking you know real conservative like the first year you make no money the second year maybe a thousand bucks maybe the yep. third year 1500 the next year maybe it drops down to 1200 the next year maybe 2400 and it just keeps growing like that and by the time you've reached 65 years old you've got 1.7 million dollars in the bank yeah yeah it's yeah well crazy. i'm even even this account now if i you know not doing any more music not putting anything into it if i didn't touch it and just let the uh um and, and invested all the dividends and just let it grow yeah 10 years it, w it would be double of, of what it is at now just doing nothing doing right. nothing and the money came from doing something you love. Yep, yep. Wait, and, wait, and, I'll, and I'll continue. I mean, one of the things I love about music is, you know, as long as I can make music that sounds like a 19-year-old or a 40-year-old, 40, 40 it doesn't matter how old I am, as long as I can, you know. So, yeah, I'll, I'll do this until I, I'll keep doing music until I physically can't. You know, I'm sure there'll be some point where I'm laying in a hospital bed somewhere. <laughs> oh, but, I can't yeah. reach the fader. Ouch. Um, yeah, you know, it, right. Musicians don't stop making music. Yeah. You're right. Until you yeah. physically can't, you might as well. And what a great retirement that if you chose to, let's say you chose to retire at 65 or 70 years old and go buy a sailboat and sail the world for a couple of years. If you didn't make another note of music, you're still going to make a six figure income every year yeah. from the music that's out there already in yeah. those 39 catalogs. Yeah, yeah. It's like who no, that's, wouldn't that, do this. <laughs> that is that's a, a that is an, a, an amazing thing about it is that yeah those uh, those cues just keep you know when you when a when a song or a cue that maybe hasn't done anything in five years and you're doing oh okay well that's just collecting dust and then boom all of a sudden it pops up and makes you a, a, you know a couple thousand bucks or a couple hundred bucks whatever it's just you know it just keeps on working for you.
It's great. Yep. Somebody in the chat room asked, um, and I'm not going to take a bunch of questions yet, but if we have time at the end, I'll take a bunch. Um, somebody said, so how do you get in those libraries in so many words? And, and I know that, you know, at least initially, a lot of them came through taxi listings, I'm guessing. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. For, for me, and I tell this to everybody, uh, I say, you know, I say join taxi for for me i my first probably uh, well back in 2003 the thing that got me on, on one life to live that was from a taxi listing that was from a i just happened to have they wanted neo soul music and i had recorded some without thinking about film or tv and and yeah. it worked and they got got through and and uh, um then when i started coming to the uh, road rallies uh, and met more people yeah from taxi listings and from uh, the people I met and the connections I made at these road rallies, which is going on this week, um, I would say that 90% of my of those 39 libraries, maybe nine, yeah, 90%. Let's just say 90% came from taxi listings or the connections I've made through taxi and because of taxi. So I just tell everybody, yeah, hey, that's you know. That's how you do it. And listen to the feedback and learn and get better and try it and listen to TV shows. There's yeah. two libraries I've been contacted by recently that ha want me to do stuff for specific shows. And um, I'm not just, you know, willy nilly in the thing. I'm watching <laughs> the shows. I'm listening to what they're doing. I'm going, oh, that's how they do their tension music on that. They're using more drones and less percussion or or vice versa. And so, uh, you know, you listen, you listen, you do your work. Uh, I always go to, even though I'm in some, um, a few of huge libraries, a few of the biggest libraries, I still go to them and listen to what other people have done in other genres to make sure that my bar is reaching at least that level. I'm of, glad uh, you brought up the tension cue because that that's one of the genres where there's tension when the bachelorette is waiting for the rose or they're eliminating people. There's tension when somebody is entering a dark room. There, there are all kinds of different tension. Yeah. So you can't just look at something and go, tension, I can make that. You gotta make the kind of tension they use on that show. And I think it's brilliant. It's common sense, but brilliant nonetheless that you watch the shows and probably jot down notes on, on a legal pad or something so yeah. that when you yeah. go create the music, you've already got a roadmap handed to you. And, and you're and you're so right. There are so many, just with tension alone. There are, I don't know. There's a hundred, uh, two hundred different kinds of tension. You know, I've I've told the story before. Uh, uh, there's a, a show. Uh, it was a network Saturday morning show called Lucky Dog that I had. I'm a, I don't know. I'm a forty episodes or so. But they it's about dogs rescuing dogs uh, and uh, getting them to new owners and training them and. Uh, it mostly kids watch the show and in the brief it was we want tension but we can't make kids cry <laughs> or <laughs> or their their parents will turn off the TV so you know you so that was a whole different challenge how do you create tension that doesn't scare somebody or doesn't make them so but you have to get a little suspense in there but yeah there's just the whole you know uh, the, the whole gambit uh, there's there's uh, um, tons of tons of kinds and probably in most genres you know, I mean, hip hop that was done uh, um, uh, 15 years ago, uh, you know, yeah. doesn't work now unless somebody has a show that's set in a 15 year ago time period, you know. A absolutely. I, you know, I, I've been saying this for 20 years easily, maybe 25, that the roadmap to making TV music is staring you in the face every day. And if you find yourself watching any form of TV, and not noticing the music, it helps you understand what kind of music music supervisors use, how they chop it up to use it. Oh, look at that. It's got a stinger ending and, it, and that sting lands right on the scene cut where it goes from the car yep. door slamming to get a, getting out of the car. You can learn so much by watching TV. Who yeah. the hell knew that your mother was wrong all those years when she said, turn <laughs> off the damn TV. No, yeah. you're wrong, yeah. mom. Turn on the TV, just take notes. Well, we, um, we, we it, it, my, I drive my wife crazy. My wife's drive last night, just last night, <coughs> she was. Uh, we were watching a show, and there was a you know a tense, a little bit of a tense scene on there, and she, you know she's all into the show. I'm into the show, and I said, "Oh, that's an Omnisphere pad they're using there," and she's just like, "You know, you just ruined the whole thing for me," you know. So, 
yeah, she, I drive her nuts when we're watching TV together because I'm always picking out the sounds of the. I, I really have developed that habit of listening to the underscore yeah. uh, behind. You know, I, I drive my wife crazy as well. For the first twenty some years of the company, my wife really had nothing to do with it, and now she's very heavily involved. And we work together. You know, we're at the office together pretty much every day. We're watching TV, no matter what we're watching. If we're uh, like binging a series on Netflix or if we're whatever, I'm constantly saying to her, "What kind of cue is that?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and teaching yeah. her the difference between like background source, which would be coming out of a jukebox in a car, or, or I mean, yeah. jukebox in a bar, or maybe a car radio, and, and you know, I'll say, "Well, what what genre is that?" Uh, I don't know, tension? Yes, you got it. <laughs> so yep. it's a, a woman who wanted nothing to do with the music industry now lives in our world. Gay Deb, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, people always ask me what, uh, what format, what audio format, digital audio format do libraries want? Do they want uh, AIFFs, WAVs, uh, high quality MP3s? What do you think is kind of the norm? They uh, they will tell you what they want. And as a good friend of mine says, uh, you know, um, whatever they want, give it to them. I have libraries that want uh, AIFF, uh, that want WAVE, that want, um, and they're sometimes just to screen something, they'll want an MP3 or they'll want an MP3 in addition to one of those. But I, I don't think I've ever, they ever just want an MP3 only at the end when you're turning in some, but they might want, you uh, um, you might want a WAV file at 44, 116, 44, 24, 48, 24, um, and almost all of our DAWs now you can export in any format that they want, but whatever they want, and they will tell you what they want. They'll have the specs of how they want it, and then you just you just do that. Do whatever, whatever they want. You know, Members sometimes... Some of our members that are new to Taxi will say, well, I can't believe that you guys are sending MP3s uh, and they're high quality MP3s, but, you know, that doesn't represent my music well. But when you're using a high quality MP3, you can pretty much hear everything you need. And as Dean just pointed out, when the library is ready to put your stuff in their catalog, they'll tell you what format they want. And they usually do want an upgrade. But I've known plenty of people, I hate to kind of publicly admit this, but I know music supervisors are very happy to take a high quality MP3 and put that in yeah. a show because they assume that nobody at home is going to hear it like we all hear it. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Uh, I guess that has happened to me a couple of times and I'm, I'm like, no, you don't, you won't want that. Okay. Whatever you want. If that's, if, if you're okay with the MP3, you're, it's your, whatever they want, give it to them. Um, Wow, I just realized we have a lot of stuff to cover and only like a half an hour left, so I'm going to move this along. Uh, should composers sign, tell everybody what a PRO, a performing rights organization, is and why they should be affiliated with one if they want to do music for any form of media? Yeah, PRO, uh, uh, performance rights organ organ organization, um, they're basically the ones that collect. Uh, the, um, they will, the, every... Every uh, uh, TV show, film, ad uh, is going to uh, submit uh, production cue sheets of all the music that's played. And the PR, whether it's ASCAP, uh, um, BMI, SOCAN Canada, what, whatever, in a whole bunch of them, different other countries, um, they are going to collect that money and uh, based on their uh, uh, rates that you get paid, and they're going to send you a check. And they also... Um, they also um, will collect the money from uh, foreign from foreign uh, countries. I've, you know, every every uh, international statement I get probably has somewhere between 50, 50 plus countries that I'm getting paid from, and they're getting for all their performing rights agencies, and they will collect it and give it to me uh, in their international royalties. So that's what they do. Should somebody, eventually you'll have to join one. Um, should you do it ahead of time or not? Um, I just say, why not? Uh, right. You know, jo join one, to, you know, do some research and figure out what you want to be in, in and and, uh, and join one. And and there are a couple libraries that want, the, there are, well, one, in, one that I'm thinking of in particular, um, they want there, and I think it's because they've been sued so much. They want to make sure that you are um, already registered your stuff with uh, 
with ASCAP or BMI or SOCAN or whatever, um, most of the libraries that I work with, um, I don't register my songs or my cues ahead of time. I uh, They will register it once I've signed, um, signed it. Unless I'm going to release it on a CD myself and I've worked out that deal with them, they will register the stuff with ASCAP BMI. And I'm guessing at least part of the reason that they prefer to register it is they register as the publisher and they might as well go ahead and register as yep. you, you as the writer at that point. And they may do a title change. If it's non-exclusive, yep. they're probably going to add, you know, a prefix on it like BB for, you know, Bad Bob's Music Library or something, <laughs> yeah. just so that they can track it and know that it's the same title. It might be, you know, I Love You, Debbie but with a BB in front of it. And that just makes the tracking easier. Or yep. they may retitle yep. it because they feel that your title doesn't do a great job of telegraphing what the music is all about. So yeah. they want to do the registrations. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. Once all the paperwork's done and they've got your tracks, uh, what does the library do next? Do they pick up the phone and send out emails to every music supervisor in the industry saying, hey, just got a great new track from Dino? No. <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, no i i think you know i you, you know you i think it's really helpful for any songwriter any artist uh, any composer to try to put them imagine that you are uh the music library the music production company and what am i going to do am i going to you know if i have a great connection with uh the a music supervisor for gray gray's anatomy Am I going to, every time I hear a great track, am I going to send it to him? No, I'm going to wait for them to ask me what they want for a particular show. And, uh, and if I have that relationship, then I will send them X amount of tracks that might work for that uh, particular scene or that particular thing. And, um, you know, and there are some shows that, that especially cable shows that, um, you know, we want, uh, we need these four or five types of tension music, um, you know, give us what, give us stuff like that. So they might send a hundred or more uh, tracks over there or give them access to their um, hard drive that, where the music supervisor can go. But um, no, they're not going to pick up and, and, and you've talked about this before. Uh, I, I hear, I just want to mention it now because it's such a common thing that people, people are getting into this business you know they truly do have a, a a great song the song is great i i had a lunch with a, a guy um recently that truly he he had some great songs but there's a big difference in film tv and ads between a great song we always want to have a great song but in this business it's got to be the right song for the scene a great song may not be right for that particular scene you know, it's got to be the right song. So I, I, you know, just because your stuff is great, you know, more power to you that you can do a great song, but it's got to be the right song. And, and that's why we do a lot of this stuff, because we don't always know what the right song is going to be. There are uh, parameters we can follow and uh, especially lyrically and mel melodically uh, to give ourselves a better shot at that stuff and style mood wise uh, doing writing to certain moods. But um yeah, it's got to be the right song and the music supervisor is going to. So don't be disappointed when your great song doesn't get get in there. You know, just wait for the right show to come along. Yeah, they're you know? not looking for hit songs to make hit records there. Here's an example. Um, they need a, a, a song about heartbreak and you've got a song that touches on heartbreak a little bit. And it's kind yeah. of a sad song, but it doesn't explain the gut wrenching heartbreak uh, heartbreak that the person in the scene is going through. It doesn't go that deep or that intense. So your song is great. It's an amazing song. And yes, it does talk about heartbreak, but it's just not perfect. Yeah. And they yeah. might take a B plus or an A minus song that really has the right lyric that moves the emotion in the scene more effectively. Yeah, and, and, and uh, to add on to this, and you're probably gonna ask about this later, but the lyrically in songs, I had a, a really good song that I'd done many years ago. It was a Neil Soul song. I'd been cut by a couple of indie artists. And it was really, it was one of those where you go, just go, yeah, that's a really good song. But I could not get it placed in film and TV. And it was a great lesson to me. The first four lines of the song went, um, uh, sunset on a beach, a small cafe, an old romantic movie on a rainy day. And it started to dawn on me, why it wasn't that in? Well, because I painted four scenes. It worked as a song for radio, but it was a sunset on the beach. 
Well, that's one scene. A small cafe, that's another scene. An old romantic movie, that's another scene. A rainy day is not working with a sunset on the beach. So, you know, it, it didn't, it wasn't, un if I had said a sunset on the beach, walking hand in hand, feels so good, my toes in the sand or something. Well, at least that's <laughs> keeping, it, keeping it all in one scene. Right. You know, so so when we're lyrically, we want to keep things. And if you can be, that's probably still too specific. If you can be less specific, um, you know, and just as you say, talk about heartbreak, or talk about love, or talk about anger, or something in a little more general terms, it, it, it can be helpful. Yeah, can Robin helpful. Frederick always says that. Don't talk about the things that cause the emotion to happen. Talk about the emotion itself because yeah. that's what the yeah. scene has. So if I say, you know, I met Debbie in Paris uh, on New Year's Eve, on a snowy New Year's Eve under the Eiffel Tower, we had our first kiss. You can't put that in a TV show or a movie because there are too many specifics. Yeah. Yep. But if you talk yep. about the minute I met her, my heart melted, that could be used yes. in a lot of places. Yes, yes, yes. Yep, it, it, exactly. And and it's, it's really contrary. I think this might be one reason why some really good country songwriters are ha had such a tough time figuring out how to write for film and TV is because to contrary when you all my years of writing when I was in Nashville, you you wrote to, you wrote detail. You learned to paint the picture, paint the furniture, you know, yeah. paint everything in, in there. And, and that's really specific to a scene. Now, that's changing somewhat now in country music it's getting less specific um but um boy if you learned how to write that way then you have to develop this new craft for writing for film and tv you know yeah, of, of being less a, a friend named jeffrey Steele, who's a, a giant yeah. uh, country yeah. songwriter everybody in nashville knows who he is he's had a bunch of huge hits and he and I were talking about film and TV one day, standing out in front of a publishing office on the row. And I was explaining this to him. He, he, it's like he couldn't get it because he spent, you know, two decades yeah. learning how to talk about the smell of the room when you walk in and are the lights dim or they bright? Um, yeah. Is she standing in the kitchen chopping a tomato or is she coming down the stairs in a beautiful dress? All those visual things are noted in country music, not yep. in sync music. Yeah. Yeah. But if you said the minute I saw her, my heart melted. There you go. Yeah. And that's pretty um, amazing. Jeffrey Steele, what a great writer. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's amazing. He many hits. Yeah. Many, many, many. I mean, he's like a top 5% country writer. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. I'm going to skip over a couple here. Um, so how long does it take um, from the moment something is placed? Let's say you've got something that gets placed in a reality show, one of your, you know, cute little uh, cues that would be for like kittens playing with each other. Um, uh, and you've got some of those, you're like the best in the business for those actually. Uh, and, and it ends up in a reality show tomorrow, which is what, November 4th. How long will it be before any form of payment shows up on, on, on your BMI or ASCAP statement? Uh, in general, it's nine months before you get get it from ASCAP BMI. Um, foreign royalties, if it gets pla placed in France and in you know, somewhere over there, it's, it can be a, a year and a half in general to get your royalties. Excuse me, but in, in this, uh, um, yeah, for domestic, it's generally nine months. And uh, I'm sure that the music supervisor or video editor who slugs in your music in France picks up the phone and calls you up. Dean, we love that, <laughs> so we love that song of yours. We're going to put it in our TV show, right? They tell you every time your music is getting used? Never. <laughs> Never, no. I, I, there, I think I have one or two publishers that... Um, well, I, if if somebody if you, somebody gets a sync fee for you, yeah, there are times when you'll find out much sooner. If you get a sync fee uh, up front, um, yeah, you'll find out because a lot of my contracts say they have to pay me within sixty days of whenever they get the money. So you'll you'll find out about that sooner. But they're not picking up the phone and calling me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I think that email. a lot of people who don't know how this industry works don't understand the speed at, at which it works. They don't yeah. understand the freneticism on the end, you know, the, the music supervisors working in a really frantic mode, the editors working in a frantic mode. And, and musicians are used to like wanting to be coddled and informed and, and 
move, you know, if somebody's going to help me move through my career. That's not the reality of music in the sync licensing world. Yeah. It's basically your music gets picked by an editor for a reality show. They slug it in, they fill out a cue sheet. The publisher doesn't even know about it generally. You don't know about it. And then get your statement from ASCAP or BMI months later. It's like, well, look at that. I made $13.76 because I had 12 yep. seconds of music in duck dynasty or whatever yep yep you you yep. were the king of duck dynasty if i, I remember right yeah i had a, i had music. a yeah the duck dynasty did really well for me yeah i like the duck show uh <laughs> yeah i think i, I don't know what I, it ended up uh, that i i had but, but the first three seasons i think i had 40 episodes or or I don't, I don't know how many i i ended up having but and some of those i had five or six placements in a, in a in one episode so it it did it did really well for me that was a yeah thanks to taxi for making that connection yes. absolutely man um can you give us kind of a range uh, I, when i was having that conversation with jeff Steele, um he said to me so how much do i get if you get one of my songs in a tv show it's like 70 <laughs> 75k and i went no <laughs> um so a sync fee. I mean, Jeffrey Steele's a huge writer, so he might get a lot more than yeah, Dean yeah. would get or a yeah. typical taxi member or somebody who's got their music in a library. If you're uh, an up and coming star that's got some sort of a brand or you're a hit songwriter, you're going to get, I don't know, for a, a song in a big feature film, you might get $10,000, $20,000, $50,000. If you're Dean Crepain, that same placement might get you 3000 5000 something yeah, like yeah. that for a big film. For a TV show, if you're getting something in Duck Dynasty, how much of a sync fee do you get up front? Duck Dynasty, I got zero sync fee up front for all of those. Uh, there are... Um, yeah, I would say that in general, I'm speaking in general terms because there's always exceptions to this, but in general, cable shows uh, um, not usually getting a sync fee. Network shows often getting a sync fee, and that can be anywhere, depending on how much they want the song. And is it in the foreground or is it background? That can be anywhere from $500 to quite a few thousand dollars. Um, uh, you there are ads sometimes ads can pay even more if you get a, a um a placement in an ad you can make you know ten thousand bucks or or more and if it's a national ad and they can renew it every six months or every year and and you can get that payment again that sync fee again so um yeah in general uh, a lot of the stuff i do gets no sync fees i'm just it's just bad a lot of the stuff for especially for cable is back in the the uh network stuff yeah, you get some. You can get some some uh, decent sync fees, which can add up. And 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 to, you know, this is a business where you know Jeffrey Steele, um, whom I love his songwriting, uh, but um, you know he he can write one one hit song a year, and it makes him you know enough money for uh, you know two or three years. Yeah. And and in this business, you know you you get your first 10 songs and then you get 20 and then you get 50 and then you get a hundred and you really, you're getting into that 500 to a thousand before you're starting to get up into those uh, of active libraries before you're starting to get up into some, um, I, this is a living, you know? And, and for me, I didn't do it as fast as some people. I thought I was doing a lot of cues. I was doing at my peak, maybe 150 cues a year. And then our, our friend, Matt Vanderbo, we heard his story and <laughs> And the guy's producing, you know, 500 cues a year. I'm going, dude, do you have no life? You know what? You know, but <laughs> so it can be done that you can really speed up the process uh, if you want to make a uh, um, a decent living at this stuff. You can speed it up, but but um, you got to produce a lot of cues fast. And I just didn't want to give up the rest of my life and do them that fast. But it's a penny business. A lot of times for yeah. placements, you're going to get, you know, a dollar eighteen or or six dollars and forty eight cents. But it is cumulative and it does add up and it keeps growing over time. And we have many members. I mean, not hundreds or thousands of members, but we've probably got, I don't know, a dozen or more members that are in the six figure club. A lot of members that are making tens of thousands of dollars a year doing this. You know, they have a day job and they're doing this in their spare time at night and on weekends. It's not going to happen overnight. It does take time. But if you stick with it and get it right, you're going to create yeah. a nice second income. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, I'm gonna skip yeah, we have a, in, my, in my tech company, we developed a plan uh, for micro licensing. And, and our whole theme is, you know, would you rather get $20,000 uh, um, on your, your sink for your tune? Or would you rather get a dollar micro license a million times throughout the world? <laughs> you know, right. so, so, you know, it, well, I, I uh, yeah, I'd like that brag about getting something for twenty thousand dollars but actually i'd rather have a million dollars it's something micro licensed uh, uh, a million times at a dollar a piece so you know because because i'm just a, a hoard of money that's all it is <laughs> <laughs> um let's talk briefly because you know what actually i may skip over some stuff so we can take some questions from the audience because they're coming up with okay. some good questions but um how do you choose they're good production music libraries and less than good ones. Um, and I always say, well, if you're, you're meeting them through taxi, you don't have to worry because we've already done the vetting. We've done the legwork to figure out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow, you just pixelated. Your forehead got weird. Hi, Dean. <laughs> That's weird. Um, <laughs> anyway. That. Yeah, that looks better. Uh, anyway, um, you know, how do you... Aside from libraries you get introduced to through taxi, uh, because you know that they've been vetted and we don't deal with uh, small potatoes or people who have questionable business ethics, things like that. We will deal with a small library that's high quality and gets the job done. It doesn't have to be a behemoth, but they've got to be really effective in what they do. So on your own, if you're meeting libraries, how do you know kind of what are the differences between a good one and a bad one? Or what are telltale signs that people should look for so they avoid the bad ones? You know, if, uh, first of all, if you can just go on online to a production library and you can upload whatever tracks and however many you want, that's not a high quality library. Because, yes. you know, because um, we've all got stuff that's not good that we've done. And, um, so I think that's a first telltale tell sign. I would also, you know, you look at, listen to what they've got there. Do they have quality music? That's another way you can look. Um, look at their credits. Uh, do they have some uh, credits with major? Now, anybody can lie and anybody can put up a, you know, hey, I've got all these ABC shows, but, but you know, doing all of these various things, um, you know, do they have good placements in good shows? And can they point you to that? Um, and also, do you, um, you know, are you, communicating just with a computer or can you actually <laughs> contact somebody there and they'll talk to you um now i've known a couple what i would say very marginal libraries that you actually can contact a person too but um i but think not uh, every day to the point of no, being a pest no 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 and and uh you, you, um, yeah, I, I just look for, and, and then, and if anybody, I just saw one recently and if they're going to, you know, for a hundred dollars a year, you can upload whatever you want to now, just, just stay away from it. Um, you know, can you make a little bit of money of those things? I guess so. You know, I just to explore that, uh, there was one or two of them that I won't name, but I had just explored that some years ago. I had uploaded a couple things to them and, you know, maybe I can can make money, but I didn't, you know, so I'd rather work with quality libraries, quality people. And as you say, taxis, you, you can vet them through taxi or you can go um, um, in, in addition, you can go to the PMA, uh, the uh, Production Music Association and uh, look at the libraries. Now, their bar is 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 really high. there are some libraries that I think are OK that they don't necessarily work with because I don't know that they work with non-exclusive right um, they don't I, yeah and and but you can generally if you go there you can know those are good libraries you know those are new quality libraries so um yeah. here's a question that i'm going to take because i can answer it in like 15 seconds um okay. the question is if you record a song and release on cd baby can you record a new version for libraries no you can't because it, it's still the same composition it's a different master but same composition so there's the answer mm -hmm. to that one let's take a couple of questions down here oh you know what one more thing i want to ask you um broadcast quality uh 
people are really confused by that term. And, and frankly, they think that it's all about audio engineering. I contend that there's more to it. It's about the appropriate, uh, a lo-fi like Bob, early Bob Dylan song would be fine. Lo-fi. Re you could record yeah. it, you know, in GarageBand on your Mac laptop using the built-in microphone and, and it would be fine. The other extreme would be something that's done in a multi-million dollar, you know, gorgeous state-of-the-art studio. Talk about broadcast quality, what it means in your daily life in regard to production music libraries. Yeah, I think it, it really just means uh, something that's clean. And, you know, if, you're, if it's just a guitar vocal, um, you know, is your guitar in tune? Are you, is, are you playing it? Is it grooving, and, you know, without altering uh, uh, um, in, in, the, the, in, in the BPM? Or, or is it, uh, is, are the vocals in tune? Is there a vibe about it? And are, is the guitar and vocal relatively balanced to what you would want to hear that by? And then, you know, bounce it down to a, a good wave file. It, it's just, it's clean having the, uh, your parts in tune played well. Uh, whatever, you know, whether you have 18 parts on there, or whether you just have two parts, having them played well, having them balanced uh, as well as you can balance them and uh, and having a vibe, having creating some mood with it. Does it create a mood? I've, I've produced stuff in the past that I think is perfect. And I think a lot of engineers would go, man, Dean, that's great. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have I, I perfected it so much it lost all the vibe. <laughs> and you just, you know, well, man, who cares? You know, so. Yeah, I think you, you can do it. Uh, and there are some libraries that and are asking for certain things. And I've had this before. We want stuff that sounds like Frank Sinatra in the 1950s. Well, the audio quality there was fundamentally different than what it is now. So do I down? And the answer is right. no, I don't make it sound bad. I make it, still make it sound good. But maybe I don't put all the glisten on it that I might uh, put on or, or uh, um, you know, so... Yeah, just clean, well played, uh, balanced out, and have some kind of vibe. That's what I would say. All right, and and and, and appropriate sounds for what you're doing. Again, there's a big difference yeah. between a Bob Dylan guitar vocal and uh, you know a Billie Eilish record. <laughs> the broadcast yeah. quality is different in each of them. Um, yeah. And we got nine, eight minutes left. Here's a question from Gloria Covington. Uh, hey, Gloria. Uh, Hi, Gloria. If you've already registered your music with the PRO and self-published, can you easily turn over your publishing to the Production Music Library? If you've already registered with the PRO and you've self-published, so your song's just sitting there, um, yeah, you should be able to, to do that. They might want to retitle it. Well, actually, I don't know the insides without retitling it, what, what they would uh, do. I know it could easily be retitled as something uh, else, as long as it's not signed exclusively uh, uh, or non-exclusively to another uh, publisher. If it's your own publishing, you should be able to turn that over, I think. And here's one from Andre Stepanian. Uh, hey, Andre. Andre. Uh, yeah. Up, kind of up in your neck of the woods, not too far from you. Um, after developing a relationship with a library and they don't have a submission request section on their website, um, what's the right way to approach them about submitting more music? I have often, once a, a libraries, and, and I did this a lot in my early days, after they accepted and uh, one or two or three um, uh, songs or cues, um, I would always ask if they wanted more and if they wanted more or if they want, had any other genres they were listening, just a quick, you know, uh, two sentence email. Um, you know, Hey, I do, you know, maybe if you've, uh, in my early days, I had done some Neo soul stuff. That's really what got me into the business. And, uh, um, but I was also flirting around learning some other genres. I remember asking a company, um, Hey, I do straight ahead pop instrumentals, uh, guitar pop instrumentals. Um, uh, are you looking for any of that stuff? And they said, yeah, send us some stuff. So just a, a quick, um, once you have a relationship, don't pester them, <laughs> but a two sentence, e yeah, don't pester them, but a two sentence email, uh, um, in, in uh, just asking them a question, um, and then, um, you know, see how they answer. And uh, but then then again, don't pester them. Don't ever pester anybody because you don't you want them out there working for you. You don't want them answering your every little question. 
And they will like you better if you don't pester them and you want them to like you because if they have to choose between your thing that they're going to send somebody and somebody else's thing and they know the other guy is a bit of a pest, they might take that into account if all thing, yeah. other things being equal. Um, People are human. Yeah. Uh, this question is from Rob. Question, do you find that there are perhaps opportunities for tracks that use obscure instruments to maybe corner a niche market? Or is that useless to go down that road? So, yeah, you know, let's yes. say you're a sitar player, for instance, that's fairly obscure. Um, do yes. you cor corner yes. the market? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I tell people all the time that if they want to pitch to a library is go to a library and find out what what the holes what don't they have and yeah a sitar piece or a didgeridoo piece or um you know i've got some i i have some accordion stuff that i did that uh, is like a french cafe or italian cafe that's you know got in the kardashian show for something you know so there are things that um that if, especially if a library doesn't have if, they, if they've already got you know uh, 60 or 70 sitar pieces then no but there are libraries that are looking to fill up every little corner of their library so yeah uh, obscure different world instruments um yeah sometimes you can do well with that you know th those are not the most sought after things but when they need it that's what they need and nothing else will do here's a question from charles robichard um, why would some music libraries not want to work with new artists? So I guess what's a, what's a turnoff? I, I, I don't, I think we want to keep this a G rated show. Uh, so I guess, so I'll just say, well, you know, don't be a jerk. And, uh, if you're, you know, and try to try to get your quality. And uh, I think that taxi is a great vehicle in a lot of ways. And one of the ways is just because you're uh, the screeners, um are 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 going to generally tell you if you're in the ballpark or not you know is your stuff ready is it not and if it's not and you can get feedback through the taxi forum you can get feedback through other artists i know everybody that's been doing this that i know that's uh, had some success is more willing to share uh um you know i have to be really careful because uh especially with my books out there that you know, sometimes I can spend five, six, seven hours a week just listening to songs and answering, uh, answering emails, um, you know, and, and saying, hey, this is really good, but man, I would mix that different or, or that. So get the feedback, make sure your stuff is good and don't be a jerk. Just be professional. Short emails to libraries. Nobody wants to read eight paragraphs, you know, two or three sentences. You should be able to tell say what you want and uh, ask them if they're interested in listening and what format they might like to receive that in. Yep, Dean made this point before I wanna underline it, which is the more time they spend talking to you, you can't be narcissistic. It's not all about you. They've got 100, 200, 500, 1,000 composers in their catalog. If they spend 20 minutes on the phone once a week with each of those, they have no time to get out there and make you money with your music. So if they make a buck, you're making a buck. They choose to spend their time getting music into shows and films and video games, commercials, whatever rather than being your hand-holding buddy in the music business. Um, that's why they all love Taxi, is we do the hand-holding and kind of teach you how to get to that pro level. And then once you kind of graduate from Taxi and you're on your own, at that point, you don't really need us, but a lot of people continue to be members because some libraries that you're in now, uh, maybe they've got a great relationship with a hit show, and that show, after nine years, gets canceled. And now they lost, you know, their, their um, biggest client and, and their sales may drop by 30% next year. And you've got a lot of stuff in that catalog. So use Taxi to build new relationships all the time because mm -hmm. like Dino, you want your stuff out there in as many catalogs as you can get, but not the ones. If you can generally upload your music to a company online and, and in most cases, that's a bad sign. It hurts me. It, it, it drives me crazy more than hurting me when people post on a forum somewhere on, on um, social media. Oh, this got rejected by taxi, but I got it into a library and people go, oh, they're holding you back, but you did it on your own. Good for you. But what they don't know is you put it in some crap library that would take, you know, somebody farting the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> So, yay. Not a bad idea. 
we actually had somebody do that years ago. We, we have somewhere in the office, we have a recording of somebody like farting some famous tune like that. Um, let me look for another question or two. Cause, wow, we've only got one minute. Actually, I'm not going to look for another question. But um, Dean, you know, the fact that you are so accessible and so helpful at the road rallies, the physical ones, the other members, uh, it's people like you and meeting guys like you, becoming friends with you and developing relationships. We've known each other for somewhere around 20 years. Yeah. Um, on my really bad days at taxi, it's people like you that remind me why I do this, why I work as much as I do, why I go through the pain and agony. I'm just so proud of you and the other people like you that looked at it and went, I can make this work and you've turned it into your full-time gig. You're making a nice living at it and you share and you inspire others. So congratulations on all that success. And thank you for, you know, always being helpful in the forums and helpful with new people at the rally. And I really, 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 I'm sorry. I forgot uh, the orange book, which is right. Submit, forget and repeat. That's still at the office. I'm looking over in my box of books here, but these two books, I'll hold them up one at a time. Um, demystifying the genre. Uh, if you haven't read this book, and I'm not saying this because I'm looking at Dean and I'm trying to score points <laughs> with him. I'm, I'm saying this because I absolutely believe it from the core of my being. If you haven't read this book and you haven't read this book, then you're going to take twice as long and work twice as hard and make easily twice as many mistakes. Spend 20, 30, whatever bucks these books cost. Let's see. Um, how much do they cost, Dino? Uh, I don't know. 10, 15 bucks or so 20 17 i don't know yeah this one's like fifteen hundred dollars um this one's seventeen hundred dollars no and send a direct check directly to me yeah that's uh no, i was that's trying to not... make a little profit there dean i wanted them to send me the check and i'd send you 15 bucks oh, no, oh. yeah the books are on amazon um bria is going to post links again in the chat we're a minute over time oh my goodness um, well i gotta but, thank you michael i i it all starts and it all started for me with really with my relationship with taxi with you with the community and the pe the people the community that you've fostered and you've cultivated and you've grown and the teaching and learning here and the opportunities and just thank you so much um you know i got gold records because of you <laughs> thank you <laughs> Now, you got you know. gold records because you wrote a great song. I just, you know, made the introduction. I, I, I bring you to the dance, but you got to be able to get up there and boogie. <laughs> well, thank you and, and your whole staff. Just, yeah, taxi. Thank you, Dean. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dean Crepane. Bye-bye, Dean. Yeah.